right, my fellow nerve nerds, I've come up with a way to draw your cervical plexus so you can practice not going insane during your head and neck unit. It starts with you getting out a piece of paper or iPad screen that is blank and drawing five rectangles. Leave some space in between each one because the next step is we will label those rectangles. Starting on the left side of the leftmost rectangle, number each one, one, two, three, four, and five. The next step is a fun one. We are going to make what I call bouncy lines from each number to the next. Looks something like this. Some might call this a scalloped line, but not a lot of people know what that is. So I like to say you make little hills between each number arcing over each rectangle. This drawing reminds me of those childhood drawings I did with the sun in the corner, hills, maybe a house like a landscape. That's kind of what I like to think of with the rest of this drawing. So coming out of the one, connected to that bouncy line, draw a Y coming up. Kind of like a telephone pole out of your landscape drawing. Next, we are going to make a bigger hill by drawing an arc from the same spot the Y originated to the three. And if you want to make two hills, the second is from the three to the five. But I like to make the second hill a mountain instead of a rounded hill. So a more triangular shape because that is a child's drawing and there's going to be a mountain in it. To some like myself, it will start to look like you're spelling out yaw. Then we're going to draw a central line up from the two in the first hill and up from the four in the second hill or mountain, basically dividing them in half with a line. On the top of the first hill, there are three trees, which you can just represent with three lines. On the tip of the mountain, or second hill, someone has placed a singular flag, which could always be represented by one line. We are almost done with the top side, so at this point we will separate top from bottom with a line, because we are really separating motor aspects from sensory aspects of the cervical plexus in this drawing. Next, we mirror the bouncy line we did on the top side, or motor side, onto the sensory side, or bottom side. You can think of this next part as the roots of the trees or whatever you want, but we are going to draw one line coming down from the two, two lines coming off the middle of the hill between two and three, and three lines coming off of the middle of the hill between three and four in a nice one, two, three pattern. That's it for the sensory side of things, but our drawing needs one last addition, and that is a sun. Every child's drawing has a sun in it. Somewhere, and in ours, it's huge, and it's coming in from the side near the Y. It also kind of looks like the profile of a butt. If that works better for you, just someone's rump totally obscuring our drawing pushed up against that Y. And you've done it! You just drew the whole cervical plexus, so let's rotate this drawing 90 degrees and label everything we just drew. So it turns out that separation line we drew between motor side and sensory side was actually to represent cranial nerve 11, spinal accessory nerve. Because while it isn't coming from our cervical plexus, we find it in the same area as a lot of those nerves, running from the sternocleidomastoid muscle across the posterior triangle of the neck to get to the trapezius muscle, doing motor things. The other line that isn't directly from the cervical plexus but interacts with it is the butt, or the sun, which is representing cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal nerve, that dips into the submandibular triangle of the neck, making a loop before heading back up into the oral cavity to get to the tongue muscles, and is very closely associated with one of the lines from the Y, which we will discuss when we label that. Everything else is from the cervical plexus proper. Now the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 actually represents spinal nerves and their levels, while the rectangles represent the cervical vertebra that those nerves are exiting from. Therefore, the lines we drew were actually those cervical spinal nerves, specifically their ventral rami, and every dip in that bouncy line when the line gets close to the number represents branches of that spinal nerve, whereas the middle of a hill will represent a combination of the spinal nerves its dips touch. Let me show you what I mean by this. So coming out of that C1 dip is the Y we drew, which represents the branches of spinal level C1, which provides motor innervation to two muscles. Therefore, we drew C1 branch to the thyrohyoid muscle and the C1 branch that travels with hypoglossal nerve up into the oral cavity and innervates geniohyoid. When looking at the first big hill we drew, we can now see how C1 contributes to part of that hill, as does C2 and C3. 
This hill actually represents our ansa cervicalis, which is a nerve loop found just anterior to the carotid sheath in the neck. And it's going to innervate three muscles, hence the three trees or lines that we drew earlier. It innervates the remainder of the strap muscles in the neck, the sternothyroid, sternohyoid, and omohyoid muscles. Because of how we drew it, we now also know that the ansa cervicalis and its branches are nerves made up of combinations of spinal nerve branches C1, C2, and C3. The mountain is exactly the same concept, but it's coming from different spinal levels. It's getting contributions from C3, C4, and C5, which we know keeps the diaphragm alive. So this is representing the phrenic nerve, which is why it is a single flag or line in our drawing instead of multiple lines, because it is one singular nerve made up of three spinal levels. Moving now to the sensory side of things, we can probably guess that the first line represents a nerve that is made up of only C2 axons, which is called the lesser occipital nerve. Remember, these are all cutaneous sensory nerves providing skin innervation to different aspects of the head and the neck. The lesser occipital nerve provides skin innervation to the skin behind the ear and down the side of the neck, sort of the lateral slash posterior aspect of the skull. The next two cervical sensory nerves originate from the middle of a hill, which means they are a combination of two cervical spinal nerves, C2 and C3 in this case. These are the great auricular and transverse cervical nerves. Both are combinations of C2 and C3 spinal nerves, but they provide skin innervation to different aspects of the neck. The great auricular nerve to part of the ear, hence auricle, which means ear, and some of the jawline, most of the skin over the sternocleidomastoid, so that sort of lateral neck area. While the transverse cervical nerve provides skin innervation to the skin in the anterior triangle of the neck. This is an easier sensory branch to identify in lab since it travels transversely from the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid across the muscle itself to get to the anterior triangle, neck skin. Lastly, the last three lines actually represent one sensory nerve that typically has around three branches of itself that you can see. That's why I put three lines instead of one. If that's too confusing though, have one nerve. So just draw one line instead of three to make it work for you. Just make sure that that line comes out of the middle of the hill between levels C3 and C4, which make up the supraclavicular nerve. Like the name suggests, the nerve provides sensation from the skin over the clavicle. And that's the cervical plexus in a drawing. You can make any time if you practice. Thanks for watching. Like this video, comment if you wish, share with your friends or your enemies, and most importantly, subscribe so that I can make more videos like this in the future. Toodles!